Benji Parker, back for another Band in the Box session. Hurrah! traumatic and thoroughly unnecessary introduction, welcome to another lesson where we dive into some jazz harmony. Hurrah! And you don't need to look at my face in this lesson either. Double hurrah! So today we're going to construct a jazz standard chord progression. I'm going to show you how to do it, give you a template for it, and uh, I suppose something you can investigate yourself. So we're going to write a 32 bar AABA jazz standard structure and we'll include all the typical things that these tunes contain and give you some insight into how it's done. So that's the plan anyway. Before we do that, you know what's coming? Yes, I'm going to, under pain of pain, instruct you to go and look at my website which is www.roundjparker.com which is a great site with a ton of stuff on it. There's a store where you can buy things, you can also hit me up for Skype lessons via the, the site and there's a lot of free resources which you can access there as well. Now, apart from that, obviously YouTube channel, uh, 400 videos or so on all sorts of subjects from filthy shred to even filthier shred and then occasionally some cool jazz and fusion stuff. Now, in all seriousness there's a lot of stuff on tons of subjects relating to music and guitar so it's a great resource so make, make use of it. Um, what else we've got? Backing tracks on SoundCloud. We've got a ton of backing tracks on SoundCloud. All free, of course. Most of the stuff is free. Though you can, if you're feeling incredibly generous, donate money to me on Patreon and help me uh, avoid starving to death. You know, becoming a skeletal form uh, this rate. So, well, that's the only reason I'm going to the gym again. But uh, nevertheless, yeah. Throw me a dollar on Patreon. If you can, if you wish. Again, all the links for this are on the website, so you can find them there. Right, enough of this. Let's get into today's lesson. So, you'll see what I've set up here. I've set up a blank canvas where I've got carte blanche to do what I like. It's a 32 bar form. You see we've got 32 bars marked out. Now, I'm going to mark out these 32 bars into four eight bar chunks. And to do that, we're going to insert a couple of simple marker chords. So, I'm going to keep this really simple. I'm going to keep this in the key of C, or overall C. So at the beginning of each 8 bar A section, I'm going to insert a C major 7. You'll see where this is all going in a moment. Now, at the beginning of what would, what would be the bridge, I'm going to insert an F major 7, which would be the 4th chord of C. And then on the last, the end of the last A section, the last 8 bar chunk, I'm going to insert another C major 7. Now these two bars at the bottom here, this is just the end, as it says end, so we'll just end on C major 7. So that's has got the most basic marker and I've got C major 7 and then I've got you know the remaining 7 bars blank. Don't know what I'm going to do there yet. Same thing here and then obviously something different for the bridge because we want to something to delineate it from the A sections and then back to the last A section. Okay so <clears throat> There are some incredibly simple and common chord progressions you get in jazz. So let's just start with these as an absolute basis, right? We're going to start with this chord progression which is called 1625. And it's uh, thoroughly, thoroughly simple. And we might say common chord progression. I know all this looks amazingly uninspiring at the moment, but give me 10 or 15 minutes and it'll end up being pretty awesome. Trust me. Trust your sensei. I'm going to copy and paste this in just for saving some time here. And for the bridge, what shall we do? Well, let's go F major 7. And this will be D minor 7 here. G7. And I'll make it go, what should we make it go there? Let's make it go E minor 7, A7, D minor 7, G7, F major 7 for 4 bars. That'll do, alright. So, this is uh, just some placeholder chords for the meantime. So what have we got? We've got 1, 6, 2, 5 and C, another 1, 6, 2, 5 and C, again and again. So you can see that our A sections, you know, there's our A section, first A section, 8 bars, looking incredibly boring at the moment. 
and same thing for the second A section again looking pretty boring and then we've got a bridge of sorts and then a corporation to finish the bridge and then back to the A section so so far so mundane here's the first thing we're going to do let's strengthen the resolution into these D minor chords by changing the quality of the minor sevens to dominant sevens which is an incredibly common thing so this would still be regarded as a sort of 1625 but the A7 chord is not diatonic, no longer diatonic to C major, but it will sound better internally. All right, well, let's play this and see what it sounds like. It probably won't sound like very much at the moment, but let's just see what our basic idea is like. Okay, right, so let's stop it there. All right, all right, so it's a basic idea, but it's not very interesting yet. So let's start working on this. Well, first of all, the second line, you know, the, the second line of the first A section, it's a bit boring having the same chord here and here. So let's swap out this chord. Let's swap this chord for E minor seven. Now, the reason this works is because the three chord can substitute for the one chord. So in the key of C major, the third chord of C major would be E minor 7, and we can swap or substitute the three for the one. So that's what we're doing there. Okay, um, what's what else? Well, this is a bit boring. I think having this A7 chord both times is kind of too predictable. So I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a chord substitution and we're going to use what's known as the 7 flat 9 or diminished dominant substitution. So instead of playing A7, we're going to substitute A7 for a diminished 7th. So there's a couple of rules for doing this. The first one would be you can substitute a diminished 7th chord for a dominant 7th chord whose root is a semitone above that of the dominant chord. Right, so I'll say that again. You can substitute a diminished seventh chord for a dominant seventh chord whose root is a semitone above that of the dominant chord, which means that you can replace the A7 with B flat diminished seventh. Now, thing being that diminished seventh chords are invertible in intervals of a minor third, so uh, B flat diminished and C sharp diminished and um, E diminished and G diminished would all be the same diminished seventh chord. So what I'm going to do is this device. Let me do it and I'll explain exactly what's happening. Well, let's try that again. Alright, so C major 7, C sharp diminished 7. This is the chord substitute for A7. But you can see what's happening in terms of root motion. I've now got this rather interesting chromatic root motion. I've got C and then C sharp and then D. Right, maybe go to G, fair enough. All right, so that's already made that a little bit more sort of interesting, exciting. We've got a little bit of chromaticism using the chord substitution here. So this is looking good. Uh, let's look at the second line. Uh, this is a little bit vanilla. So this is what I'm going to do here. Uh, let's regard this chord as a temporary target. So we're approaching our temporary target via its five chord, its dominant chord. Instead of doing E minor seven, let's do E minor seven flat five which would be the minor two, which is probably more appropriate because it's leading towards, temporarily at least, D minor. All right, so that's looking better. So you can see that it's changed from this extremely sort of simple 1625 into something that looks a bit more interesting, it's got more motion in it, but it's fundamentally not really any different. Okay, right, so there we go, there's our first, there's our established A section, nothing remarkable or tremendous, but it's at least got something going on. Okay, now what happens in these tunes is that the A sections are generally the same. So let's just temporarily copy and paste all the A sections in so it'll all be the same. All right, let's have a look. 
So first A section, I'm willing to live with that for the meantime. Now the second A section, there's a problem here because the G7 chord doesn't lead so well to F major 7. G7 is the 5 chord of C and we'd really want to resolve to C so it'd be better if it wasn't. So normally what you do to approach a chord like this is you'd approach it via its 5 chord. Now the 5 chord of F major 7 is in fact C7. So let's just change the G7 to C7. Yeah, this causes another problem in that this chord is no longer really any good because this is not going to provide a very good chord progression. So this chord really needs to be C, C major 7. And then that'll sound more logical, but then again that messes up this turnaround here. So the solution to this is to take these four bars, this turnaround, but just compress them down to two bars each. Like this. So you see we're using the same material, but we're compressing it down so we arrive at C major 7 there, which means we have this bar left over to prepare for the modulation into the F major 7. Alright, now again, this is okay, but it's a little bit uninteresting, so let's take our 5 chord and stick a 2 in front of it. Right, so now the 2 of uh, C7 would be G minor 7, or should I say the 2 of F is G minor 7. So this is a 2-5 leading us into F. Alright, now that's looking a lot, a lot healthier now. Okay, good. Like the way that looks, looks quite elegant. And we're preparing the modulation into the bridge quite well. Good. Okay, right now, this bridge section, it's looking, to be honest, rather dull. So let's uh, let's rewrite this bridge because it's, it's, nothing's happening and it's not very good. So F major 7, Let's use this technique here in this bar. We're going to introduce what's called subdominant minor. Right, the four chord of C major is usually F major or F major seven, but it's possible to use F minor. Now this chord is borrowed from the parallel minor key of C minor. That's where it comes from. But we do something rather sneaky here. So even though I'm borrowing this from a, 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 a related key, uh, an adjacent key or parallel, parallelly, parallel related minor key. I'm going to use this as a springboard for something else. So if it's a minor chord, even though this is subdominant minor in C, I can treat this like it's the two of some key. So that's what I'm going to do. So what key is F minor seven, the two of? The answer is E flat. So I'm going to put in a two, five, one. F minor seven, B flat seven, which would lead to E flat major seven. Right here, right, so this is no good. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Okay, this is sneaky. So, F minor 7, B flat 7, E flat major 7. Let's use this device, which is incredibly common. I'm going to use what's called tone down modulation here, where the key center is going to drop a tone. So, we were in E flat. And I'm dropping the key center a tone to D flat. This is a device you hear in all sorts of standard tunes, just to name a couple. Miles Davis tunes, tune up, and so on. Both contain this sort of movement. All right, now I've got this bar here, and I need to get back to C major seven. So I'm going to do this via a two five, which could be D minor seven, and then G seven. That would work. But what would be more clever and a hell of a lot more elegant is if we did D minor 7 flat 5 to G7. The reason this is so sneaky is because there's only a one note difference between this chord and this chord. Basically, if you take this chord, D flat major 7, and raise the root to D, it becomes D minor 7 flat 5. So, in terms of voice leading, it's just incredibly smooth and elegant and extremely sneaky because this is the 2 5 of C minor. But you can see where it leads back to. It leads to, it leads to C major. So a minor two five in this case, two five C minor can resolve to C major without any difficulty. It's quite able to do that. All right. So let's just see. That means our bridge is now looking quite interesting. Well, maybe at this stage we should actually play the result and see what we've got and see how everything's sounding. All right. So here we go.
so I think that's sounding fairly good now. So let's just have a look through it and see if there's anything else we can do that might make things more interesting. Well, the only thing I would say is that it's possibly just a little bit boring to have too much of this same repetitious chord progression. So I'm going to do another sneaky little move here. So we've already seen that we can borrow some chords from the parallel minor key, F minor, is borrowed from C parallel minor. So I'm also going to borrow this chord. E flat major 7 is borrowed from C parallel minor where it would be the 3 chord. And this is incredibly like the move you get in a standard tune called Lady as a Tramp, if you're familiar with that tune, so that's really where I've stolen it from. What's neat about this is you've got C major, then you're implying C parallel minor, and then there's actually a connection between these two chords, E flat major 7 and D minor 7, where this would be the 4 and this would be the 3. So there is actually a relationship between these two chords, so the change will sound good and interesting without me doing anything else. What happens on a lot of jazz harmony is that you get overlaps in terms of motion. So, for instance, in this chord progression, A7 is a 5 chord of D minor. But the D minor itself is actually a 2 chord. It's part of the 2 chord of C major, 2, 5, 1. So the reason that this sort of thing works is because of root motion. If you actually look at the direction that the roots of these chords are moving, you should notice that everything is moving in fifths. So E to A to D to G to G to C is all root motion anti-clockwise around the circle of fifths. There's actually a name for this sort of root motion and it's called back cycle. And it's incredibly common in, in so many standard tunes, like, for instance, autumn leaves, um, all the things you are, is an extremely clear example of back cycle movement, chord motion, root motion anyway, I should say. Okay, so is there anything else I want to do here? Uh, let's start stick in a few other little sneaky things on this last turnaround. Let's let's do a little bit of tritone substitution. Okay, so I'm going to tritone substitute these chords. I'll do it first, and I'll explain why I'm doing it, why it is the chord it is. Okay, so there's a tritone substitution here. <clears throat> so substituting the A7 chord with E flat seven. Right now, so tritone substitution works this way. You can substitute any dominant seventh chord with another dominant seventh chord whose root is a flattened fifth away from that of the original. So I'll say that again. You can substitute any dominant seventh chord with another dominant seventh chord whose root is a flattened fifth away from that of the original. So A7, a flat five away from A7 is E flat seven. So we can substitute the E flat seven for the A7. And functionally, musically, they do the same job. Again, if you're wondering why this works, I have a video on tritone substitution where I explain it very carefully. And we've done the same tritone substitution on the G7 tritone sub for G7 is D flat 7. Okay, right, now I don't think I want to do anything else to this in terms of changing the harmony. So here's the last thing we'll do is let's just posh up the chords. Let's, let's tart them up, okay? So C major 9, C sharp diminished will leave as is. D minor 7, that will get the D minor 9 treatment. And then let's change this to G13. All I'm doing here is, imagine I'm just putting decoration on the chord. It's a bit like your Christmas tree. You've got a Christmas tree, you stick it up and it looks okay, but it's not the same if you don't have the fairy lights and the angel on the top and, you know, the candy canes and whatever else you put on, the baubles. You need all that stuff, especially for jazz. It's fantastic. So, that's all I'm doing here. I'm toughing up the chords. And what about some of the uh, extensions or alterations I'm using? Um, if the dominant chord is resolving down a fifth, then I can liberally alter the dominant chord um, using sharp five, flat five, sharp nine, flat nine. If it's not resolving down a fifth, as in this case, then you're probably safer just putting an extension like a nine, eleven, or a thirteen on the chord rather than an alteration because it's not really resolving down a fifth. Well, it's not resolving down a fifth. So that's the logic there for that being G13, whereas that's G7 sharp 5, that's an altered dominant. All right, C major 9. And should we go E flat major 9 here? Why not? Fond of the ninth, as you can see. And ninth is probably the simplest good colour to add to any chord. Again, G13 here rather than an altered dominant chord. And let's 
choose a different dominant extension here. Let's go A7 sharp 9, D minor 9, and let's go, let's go a flat 9 now, shall we? You can really just pick and choose the alterations on your dominant chord, it doesn't matter too much. We'll leave this as C major 7, G minor 7, C7, let's make this C7 flat 9, why not? Just because we can. Uh, this is okay, so F major 7 for 2 bars. Sometimes it's not a great idea to alter every single chord, so I'm just going to leave F major 7 as is. F minor 9. And I'm going to choose not to alter the dominant chord here. When you have a dominant chord which resolves down a fifth like it does here, you don't have to alter the dominant chord. You can leave it alone or you can just put an extension like a 9 or 11 or a 13 on it. Um, so you could alter it, but in this case I'm deciding not to. <coughs> I will alter this dominant chord. Yes, I will alter this dominant chord. If I can get the right chord symbol in. Oh, oh dear. Doesn't like that. Hey, yeah, that's better. Uh, D flat major 7, I'll leave that alone. Let's put a nice alteration on the G7 chord. G7 sharp 5 sharp 9, please. Thank you very much. And then C major 9. Diminish will leave alone, D minor 9, this is really just the same as the first A section now, as you can see, pretty much the same. Uh, try it in substitutions, so let's colour these up. Right. And D minor 9, that should sound pretty good. Okay, right now, since this is very much in a sort of bebop type style, I think we should crank the tempo up a bit. 160 would really be proper bebop. Let's, let's hear it at a John Coltrane like 240 and see what it sounds like. Alright, let's play and see what we think. sounds pretty good. I don't really have an issue with that. Oh, that's a D minor 9 there. Okay, so I would say that that is a, for the sort of tune it is, it's not too bad. It's very stylistic. It does all the things that these sorts of standard tunes do. So let's just review. We've got our first A bar A section and we've got pretty much the same thing with some variation in the second A bar A section, but it's clearly related material. And then we have something clearly different, differentiated, delineated, the bridge, and then back to the last A section. Uh, okay, it's all looking good. Alrighty, so I'll issue this challenge to you. Um, see if you can write a tune along similar lines using some of the same techniques that I've talked about here. Uh, the best way of getting good at this sort of composition is just to do a lot of it and you understand really how this sort of harmony works. Uh, I would also recommend that you check out as many jazz standard tunes as possible because the, the lexicon and vocabulary of jazz standards is really just as easy to understand as simple or uh, pop uh, harmony, but you just it's just a different sort of vocabulary. It's just a different way of doing things, though in the end it's not necessarily any harder. I know it looks a lot harder because there's so many chords and there's so much alteration and so much movement, but really it does follow very... I'm not going to say strict rules, but there are definitely rules about how chords move, which you hear all the time, and once you've been exposed to this stuff enough, then you just think, right, okay, it's that sort of thing. 
Alrighty, well that'll do for this rather long lesson. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you found it interesting, and I'll see you next time for another of these band in a box lessons. Am I just instead from the box? Yep. Yeah. Here's a joke for you before I go. What's the difference between a drummer and a drum machine? And the answer is you only need to punch the information into a drum machine once. Thank you very much. I've been around Jay Parker. Don't forget to check out the website. I'll see you next time, guys. Farewell!